regardless if you're feeding uh, improved or maybe a standard pellet quality, there is some degree of nutrient segregation. And when I say nutrient segregation, uh, I'm just meaning that the, the profile of the feed differs from one area of the house to the other. Um, and our goal was to let's best identify a marker for nutrient segregation. And we looked at things, uh, as I've already mentioned, phytase activity, we looked at total amino acids, we looked at proximate analysis, things that we could achieve uh, rapidly with a, maybe a NIR. Um, and what we found is um, several of these nutrients or, or um, things like phytase, may, we may be able to pick up differences uh, along the feed line uh, and they may be, you know, it may vary a great, great deal, uh, but they might not contribute to any uh, real differences to the bird. Welcome to the Feed Science Podcast. Uh, I'm Ron Hollenbeck. I'll be hosting today's episode. Uh, we're going to be talking about pellet quality and its impact on nutrient segregation at the farm. Uh, our guest today is John Boney at uh, Penn State uh, University. Welcome, John. And if you would uh, give a, you know, a, a brief uh, background of yourself and, and, and what you do. Very good. Thanks for the opportunity. Really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to come speak here. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm an assistant professor here at Penn State University in the animal science department. I started here in January of 2018 uh, with an extension and teaching appointment. Without an, within that appointment, I do conduct applied research, uh, which is much of what I'll talk about today. Um, my background, I grew up in southeast Ohio on a small cow-calf operation um, and was very interested in agriculture and continuing studying agriculture. Uh, went to West Virginia University for my undergraduate degree. Uh, there I had a really unique opportunity to get involved with uh, animal nutrition research, feed milling research. Uh, Dr. Joe Morch gave me an opportunity to, to work in his lab, uh, which led to me actually managing the university feed mill as part of my responsibilities throughout grad school. Uh, so I did remain there uh, and earn my master's and my PhD at West Virginia University while I studied applied poultry nutrition as well as feed manufacturing. Good. Thank you for that, John. Eastman serves veterinarians and nutritionists in agrochemical and animal health industries by helping them select, evaluate, and implement innovative nutritional programs. Eastman works with your team to customize your gut health approach in feed and water. Eastman's approach addresses nutritional and bacterial challenges and finds new ingredient preservation and hygiene solutions. Explore ways to accelerate and innovate your programs. Contact the animal nutrition team at eastman.com. We'll get into to, to pellet quality here. I mean, this, this is a topic that... Uh, you know, I've I've struggled with through uh, the 30 years of my career in this industry. I mean, we uh, certainly understand the impact and the need for uh, for a good quality pellet in front of the animal. But uh, coming from the feed operations side, we're always pushing the mills uh, as hard as possible to get throughput. So when you're when you're when you're pushing the mills that hard, something has to give. So uh, I'm very interested in hearing your uh, your thoughts and research on you know the, the animal performance side because we got to balance the two. The feed mill has to uh, certainly get the animals fed, but uh, we we need to you know give the animals what they need as well. So uh, if if you would please uh, take it away and help us understand better the the how pellet quality affects uh, affects the animal. Yeah, you make some really great points. Uh, first and foremost, we have to appreciate uh, the most important thing here is that the animals have access to feed. 
Um, and, and those throughput demands do drive uh, this industry. And, and I can fully appreciate that. Uh, my job as a, a person that does feed milling and applied nutrition research is to best understand how to get the, the maximum performance and efficiency out of these animals. Um, and, and feed quality has proven as an opportunity uh, to further improve feed conversion ratios, further improve uh, the, the tonnage of product that you can put through a processing plant. So uh, when you think of it holistically and think about the, the overall impacts, uh, there are certainly some uh, monetary benefits to putting uh, time and resources into improving pellet quality. Um, now, it's not something that's going to be uh, this immediate and obvious return on investment uh, like you might see with some other uh, additives that you can put into feed. Um, but uh, the, the research suggests that there is an opportunity to save um, considerable dollars for the operation as a whole uh, whenever pellet quality is a focus. Um, I can appreciate that many of the feed mills that are uh, in, in use today, uh, being used to feed uh, the billions of broiler chickens across the U.S., uh, many of them are dated. Uh, many of them are undersized, and we are really making those mills produce more feed than they were ever really designed to do. Uh, so uh, there are opportunities if, if you take the the potential economic benefit uh, of providing pellet qualities and use that as uh, dollars for investing back into the feed mill, perhaps investing in additional uh, lines or uh, additional equipment that is scaled appropriately. Uh, there's some opportunity to uh, improve the overall economics of, of a integrated operation. Yeah, and that's uh, you know very very true. And I'm just I'm sitting here thinking about uh, the how how we typically run feed mills in in the states. I mean, if if that pellet mill is is sold at say a 50 ton an hour machine, we're instantly trying to figure out how do we get 60 ton out of it, uh, which is you know, certainly completely different than, uh, you know, other countries would, you know, Europe as an example. I mean, pellet quality is a, a, a big focus for them and quite honestly wouldn't feed the pellet quality that, uh, that we're feeding some animals in this country, but their costs are way higher as well. So, I mean, that, how do you, I guess what's what's the in your opinion what's the the optimal uh, balance I guess between the two or if if that can even be answered. That's a great question and one that we get asked a lot when when discussing this topic, and the the animal feed production industry is very unique in that no two feed mills are going to be alike. There's going to be differences in equipment, uh, differences in the grain coming in, differences in diet formulations used. Uh, so there's not one blanket answer. Um, this is something that's going to be have to be customized for each of these operations. Uh, so, so I think that if pellet quality is, is or providing improved pellet quality is a goal of the integrator, uh, they're going to have to do some internal testing and uh, can be continually fine tuning because this is a, a quite a delicate balancing act of uh, meeting the, your throughput demands, trying to optimize uh, pellet quality, but also maintaining the nutrient availability, right? There are some techniques we can use uh, to increase the quality of the pellet, but we have to think about the nutrients uh, and how we're impacting those with some of our, our techniques to improve pellet quality. Uh, with my research, uh, really what I wanted to do was to provide maybe some fresh perspectives, some new perspectives on improving pellet quality. We've talked about this a lot. Uh, I think some of the work from Patton in 1937 with some of the first 
uh, in the literature that, that I could find to support feeding pellets over mash. We, we've known this for a long time, that there are benefits to the animal. Uh, a lot of the literature uh, that, that is available now uh, does do direct comparisons of feeding different percentages of pellets and fines and, and thinking about uh, how much FCR can I, uh, benefit can I get to the bird. Uh, we wanted to take it a step further, right? We wanted to look at the, the whole picture and we wanted to take this to the farm. We wanted to understand if the pellet quality uh, improvements or your investment in pellet quality would translate to differences in the house and in the feed pans in front of the birds. Um, and then we also appreciated that uh, these houses are different, right? We have some feed bins that are located near the front of the house and the lines will extend the full length of the barn, uh, while other barns have more centrally located bins and they're pulling feed to either end of the barn. So we have the length of the, the feed line uh, that the feed is being pulled that may contribute to uh, differences uh, in the house. And then we have the uh, pellet quality we're bringing in. So we're trying to fully appreciate the dynamics of feed manufacturing, the dynamics of different environments in the house, uh, and really just fill a knowledge gap in the literature uh, perhaps folks can can make decisions based on this to to bring in a little bit more uh, profit at the end of a flock. Have you, in your research, uh, looked at the different conveyance systems on on poultry barns and and its impact uh, on on pellet quality or nutrient segregation, whether it's the you know, the, the flex auger type or the, the, the drag conveyor, the cable conveyor uh, system, has that, uh, has that shown uh, much of an impact? That's a great question. And I'll say uh, we're not there yet. There are not many labs uh, in the country that are, are looking at this in the house, um, you know, on the farm. So we, we've, we've put together a nice body of work so far and we've uh, just received a, uh, another grant to continue studying this. Uh, so I'll tell you where we are right now. We, we've studied uh, taking different pellet qualities from a mill uh, to the to the house and looking at this in a replicated manner and, and collecting feed samples along 500 foot long feed lines uh, and looking at things such as um, you know your proximate analysis, things that you can achieve with a NIR. But we also invested in uh, amino acid analysis, phytase activity analysis, uh, and we did some uh, feed quality analysis at every feed pan along the line. So in, in the one study that I'd like to talk about today, we, we had over 3,000 feed samples that were analyzed and tried to really paint a nice picture of, of how feed flows through a house. Um, I think that once we continue building this body of work and literature, um, we will be able to consider things like the conveyance systems. Uh, one important part of conveyance that uh, was really brought to our attention in a recent field study here in Pennsylvania is the uh, quality of the auger on the feed truck. Uh, there's a lot of old feed trucks uh, in use and you might have really nice pellets coming from the mill and you might have really nice pellets when you show up at the farm and if your feed auger is chewing those pellets up but right before they end up in the feed bin, um, it's going to contribute to the quality of the feed that is presented to the bird. So that's why we're trying to appreciate the, the system as a whole and um, maybe highlight some areas of opportunity. Yeah, and uh, I have personally experienced uh, that issue with the feed trucks. Uh, we've had uh, instances where, you know, one of the hydraulic motors goes out and, and they think they're putting the correct motor on, but uh, it, it's, a, you know, a, a slightly faster speed uh, motor as an example. And then at that transition from the floor auger to the upright auger, they're not, the speeds aren't, 
aren't synchronized correctly and you just chew the pellets up before it ever gets there. And I mean, and that can go on for months and years. And uh, I mean, you're chasing your tail trying to figure out why the pellet quality is so poor and, and never, never went back to the truck to take a look at, at, at the impact it may have. Yeah, you got it. it there's uh, there's a lot to that. And uh, yeah, I fully appreciate that you've been in that situation. We, we are uh, in my lab. We're trying to follow that feed and, and really understand if I collect a feed sample in the feed mill and I'm doing some maybe it's a pellet durability, pellet durability index analysis or I'm running it through a new home and pellet tester. Uh, it, but whenever I look in the feed pans at the farms, uh, and, and we just see this, uh, you know, significant decrease in, in feed quality. Uh, we, we need to, you know, work backwards from that feed pan and fully appreciate where that pellet degradation occurred. And another question I would have is, is have you looked at differences in pellet quality at the feeder uh, whether it's a, a, a barn with a tandem bin system or a single bin system. Uh, and I mean, the, the reason for this question is, uh, I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this, but uh, had an a pellet quality issue at a feed mill that, uh, that I was at in the past and uh, on a particular feed. And it was a, a feed that we all, we had one bin assigned for that feed type in loadout. And come to find out, we, we never actually completely emptied the bin. So, I mean, as we know, pellets are heavier than, than fines. So the pellets would come out and the fines would, would remain in the bin. Then we'd fill the bin back up and pull it down, you know, to you know, say a quarter of a percent uh, capacity, and so then pretty much what was left in there was fines at that point. And we fill it back up. So I mean, just cycles of doing that. It didn't matter if we were putting a hundred percent pellets in the top of that bin. There was garbage coming out because we never cleaned it. So just curious if if in your um, uh, research have have done any comparisons on tandem bins versus a, a single bins feeding a barn? Great question. And I'll say to date, uh, they've all been tandem bin setups at the farm. We've not done any uh, work with single bins, but can certainly appreciate uh, the problem and the, the challenge there. Mm -hmm. So okay. if you want, I could uh, tell you a little bit about some of our findings. Um, sure. And, and I think that you know, I'm really proud of the work that, that we did in the lab. I've got a, a PhD student who's spent uh, her entire graduate career here working on this through a master's and a PhD um, and has, you know, really positioned herself well uh, because this is an area that not many folks study. So what we found is, as you would expect in these what we'll call long feed lines or the feed lines that extend the full length of the barn, um, regardless if you're feeding uh, improved or maybe a standard pellet quality, there is some degree of nutrient segregation. And when I say nutrient segregation, uh, I'm just meaning that the, the profile of the feed differs from one area of the house to the other. Um, and our goal was to let's best identify a marker for nutrient segregation. And we looked at things, uh, as I've already mentioned, phytase activity. We looked at total amino acids. We looked at proximate analysis, things that we could achieve uh, rapidly with a, maybe a NIR. Um, and what we found is um, several of these nutrients or, or um, things like phytase, may, we may be able to pick up differences uh, along the feed line. Uh, and they may be, you know, it may vary a great, great deal, uh, but they might not contribute to any uh, real differences to the bird. So to be more specific, um, we did look at phytase activity, uh, and we found that in uh, shorter feed lines with poor pellet quality, our phytase activity actually varied by over 70% from one part of the house to the other. 
Now, it's always important to, to note uh, that this was post pellet applied phytase. Uh, so there was an opportunity for some slothing off uh, as that feed was subjected to those um, forces in transport as well as augering down the line. So we know that that contributed. Uh, but when we, we took this back to the university and we fed birds uh, feed that varied in phytase activity to that degree, um, we found that it didn't result in any differences in bone mineralization or yield or growth. Uh, now, this is one experiment. We used one you know, phosphorus inclusion level in the feed, one specific product. So there's a lot more to learn here. But at the end of the day, what we learned was phytase might not be our best marker of nutrient segregation. However, when we're looking at um, things like proximate analysis, crude protein, crude fiber, ash, moisture, it was uh, we, we were unable to pick up differences uh, with, with those proximate analysis. We need something a little bit more specific. And what we've uh, isolated and, and found serves as the best nutrient segregation marker tends to be amino acids. Uh, now, the problem there are amino acids uh, are more expensive to have analyzed, right? So we were trying to find a really cost-effective nutrient segregation marker. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, in that long feed line with poor or maybe standard quality feed, uh, we found a great deal of nutrient segregation uh, in that we had six out of the 12 analyzed amino acids varying uh, from one end of the house to the other. Um, and that did translate into differences in broiler performance. As you can imagine, if you feed a really amino acid dense diet, uh, those birds are going to have an opportunity to turn that into breast tissue uh, and, and have higher yields, higher body weights. Uh, so uh, all of this is uh, aligning to, to support that if, if you're feeding a poor quality feed, uh, you may have differences from one end of the house to the other. This is particularly important if you have migration fences in place that is limiting birds access to move uh, along the length of the barn to different areas. Um, so, so it was uh, it was substantial. Uh, there was a considerable amount of broiler performance variation. Uh, and when I, I'm going back to this idea of thinking about it holistically, uh, that becomes important when we move into the processing plant, right? We have birds of different sizes, uh, different breast yields. Um, as our labor challenges continue and we continue moving to more automated processing, uh, bird uniformity is going to become more and more important. So uh, our work does support that improving pellet quality minimizes that nutrient segregation on the farm, which supports a more uniform flock uh, which should, in theory, help us as we move into the processing plant in these more automated plants. Uh, th this is probably a little bit off off subject, but as you as you explained that, my my mind went to, uh, and you probably haven't analyzed this, but you said the the, the phytase was a post pellet applica application for phytase. Um, where my mind went is, is, is there a, a difference if you're using, uh, you know, the more heat stable dry product that gets thoroughly mixed in the mixer versus, uh, you know, liquid applied, uh, phytase post pelleting that, that if you, I mean, we all know with post pellet liquid applications, if you're, if you have a significant amount of fines at that point, it's certainly going to impact uh, the distribution across across all feed and and recoverability. And and also, my mind went to liquid aminos, whether it's liquid lysine, uh, liquid methionine. Uh, you know, has that uh, you know shown any 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 impact in that segregation through the barn and I apologize. I'm sure you haven't had a chance to do that, but uh, just interested in your initial thoughts, I guess, on uh, whether that would have any impact or not. Yeah, great question. And actually, we have. We have absolutely considered this. We have a paper under consideration right now with the Journal of Applied Poultry Research 
Um, and we are in the process of publishing results from uh, that mixture added phytase uh, and, and looking at its um, segregation in short houses. So what we found there was absolutely, if, if you are using a mixture added product, um, something that is going to be thoroughly mixed and part you know, included through the, the pelleting process, uh, we can minimize the phytase segregation that we're able to pick up uh, in those poultry houses. But you also said you didn't notice any differences in bone density. So I, I mean, I, it's, it, it makes sense in my mind that, that that would reduce the, uh, the segregation, but I guess in my mind, does it, does it really matter to the animal? Cause that's ultimately, uh, all that matters. Uh, yeah. the liquid would be less expensive, I believe. I think there's a age component to this. We did analyze that bone density uh, at uh, a little bit later at 35 days of age. Um, and I, you know, when you think about the bone development, we know that this is a really critical part. Those first three weeks of the bird's life uh, where they're developing that bone. Um, and I, when we do this work again, we're going to consider those time points and we're going to look to see if that phytase segregation impacts early uh, bone density or mineral density uh, because that's whenever, if it's real, if there is a real response to the bird early on, that's when you might see uh, challenges in the field. I don't, I, all of the research we've done doesn't suggest that we're going to see uh, the segregation of phytase that would occur in a house contributing to those birds not being able to to uh, develop that bone effectively. Okay. It's time for our famous three. Avonic Animal Nutrition is committed to ensure food security and safety while reducing the ecological footprint of animal farming. Its products and services use evidence-based solutions that seek to promote animal welfare and reduce reliance on natural resources. All this is underpinned by long-standing industry partnerships and deep customer understanding. Ivonics focus on efficiency, sustainable, healthy nutrition, and collaborations with livestock farming partners creates value for customers and consumers. I've enjoyed this conversation, and we could probably keep talking for uh, for quite a bit longer, but uh, we probably ought to start to wrap this up. Um, as first of all, thank you. I really appreciate your insight. Uh, it's been uh, been very interesting for me. Um, at at the end of these sessions, we always like to uh, ask. There's three questions uh, we'd like to finish with, and the first one is, um, you know, what is your What's your favorite or go-to resource from a, a you know a feed science or, or nutrition perspective uh, for uh, to to gain information for for you? Yeah, I appreciate that question. Uh, I always refer back to the AFIA feed manufacturing feed manufacturing technologies book. Uh, and my graduate students read this and they pull a lot from that. Uh, we use it to guide us in our research. So um, I, I got to give a shout out to Joel Newman, uh, former president of AFIA, who was a mentor of mine, uh, was able to make sure I had a copy of that book. And it's been incredibly useful uh, throughout my career. Yeah, I went to K-State in the feed science program, and that was just referred to as our Bible as we went <laughs> through school. So, uh, but yes, that is a tremendous resource. Uh, second question, uh, kind of along the same lines, but uh, what's, you know, what's a, what's a resource that, that you go to that, you know, may not be uh, directly related to feed science or uh, or nutrition. Just what's uh, what's a resource that's helped you throughout your career? Yeah, I appreciate that question as well. And I'm going to come at this from a my animal science department that I reside in uh, background. Uh, and I'm trying to reach uh, undergraduate students of really diverse backgrounds. So I refer to the Scientific Farm Animal Production textbook. 
um, that, that was actually part of the curriculum when I was going through my undergraduate degree. Uh, and it's it's got a nice, uh, I, I like how it's written. I like how uh, broad it is and how it helps me relate to students that may not be directly involved with poultry production or, or feed science. Okay. Uh, the last question is, uh, in your experience, um, what separates uh, people in the, you know, the feed or nutrition realm? Uh, uh, what separates people who are uh, successful from those who may be less successful? Yeah, uh, I really think this comes back to hard work. Uh, hard work means a, a lot to me. Um, I, I think you can take a student who uh, may be an average performer in the classroom, uh, but has an incredible drive and ability to work hard. Uh, and, and you can see that person progress in their career uh, as quick or quicker than your 4.0 student. Uh, and then lastly, attention to detail. Uh, the devil's in the detail. And I, I really think that uh, focusing on those details uh, can really separate um, an average person from a from a very high performing person. Sure. Great. Uh, well, thank you, John. Uh, again, appreciate your insight. Appreciate your time. Um, so I guess uh, this will wrap up uh, this episode of the the Feed Science Podcast. Uh, I'm Ron Hollenbeck. Uh, thank you, John, and thank you for for listening.